Hey, CW Bio, Mr. Kennedy here with part two of your chapter four notes. Uh, in this video series, we're going to look at biomes or life zones as they exist around the world. I'm going to take you on a quick trip to just share with you some of the facts and figures about all the different localities on Earth and how they're differentiated from one another by the abiotic and biotic factors that exist there. So the first thing we're going to do is just take a look at what is a biome. A biome is a large group of ecosystems that share the same type of climax community, and they're divided up into two grand divisions, a terrestrial division and an aquatic division. The word terrestrial means land, and I bet you know what aquatic means. Yeah, water. Okay, so the organisms that live within each of these areas are specifically adapted to life in these areas, and we need to kind of understand, A, the adaptations that they have, and B, what are those conditions? So let's check this out, okay? Biomes located on land, those are the terrestrial ones. Oceans, lakes, streams, ponds, and other body, bodies of water are the aquatic ones. Aquatic biomes cover approximately 70 to 75% of the Earth's surface, depending on if you're just talking about the marine biomes or if you're talking about marine plus freshwater biomes. Most of the aquatic biomes on Earth are actually salty. So if we took the number 75%, like more than 70% would be salty, and then the rest would be fresh. Freshwater is combined to just rivers, streams, ponds, and most lakes um, that are on the surface. And yeah, it could be argued that there is fresh water and groundwater, but um, like aside from humans, it's really hard for other living things to tap into that. So we're just gonna ignore that for now. And we're gonna focus on the idea that that fresh water is confined to rivers, streams, ponds, um, and lakes. All right, so as a result of this differentiation between salty and fresh water, Aquatic biomes are separated into two terms, marine and freshwater biomes. The marine biomes are the salty ones, and the freshwater, you guessed it, they're fresh. Uh, the marine biomes, uh, well, basically, this is all of the parts of the ocean, okay? And uh, you might have watched, you know, the Pirates of the Caribbean at some point and know that, you know, well, there's like the seven seas and stuff like that, right? But at the end of the day, Ocean is not all like the same thing. When you use the word ocean, well, like sometimes people assume it's all the same temperature, it's all the same depth, it's all the same salinity. And that's not true. Different parts of the ocean differ in biotic and abiotic factors. So salinity, depth, availability of light, temperature, all different. And subsequently, the life that we find in those areas also different. One of the ways ecologists study marine biomes is to make separate observations in shallow, sunlit zones and deeper, unlit zones. The portion of the marine biome that's shallow enough for sunlight to penetrate is called the photic zone, like photosynthesis, because, you know, that's where photosynthesis is going on. The deeper water that never receives light, you guessed it, a photic zone, okay? So A is without or not. So there is no photosynthesis that goes on there. Every once in a while, we'll find a place where fresh and salt water mixes along the coastline. These are called estuaries, and they're kind of like, I don't know, the breadbasket, so to speak, of life along our shorelines. They harbor massive amounts of life because you get an overlap of fresh and salt water, an overlap of biomes. You get creatures that could take advantage of two ecosystems simultaneously. So these are like really important nurseries of life. An estuary defined here is a coastal body of water partially surrounded by land in which fresh and salt water mix. The salinity or the amount of salt in an estuary ranges between that of seawater and that of fresh water depending um, uh, largely on how much water is flowing through the river or stream, like into the estuary and whether or not it's high tide or low tide. At high tide, when there's more salt water pushing in, then it's probably more salty. And at low tide, it's probably more fresh. Okay. So tides, tides, you know, everybody has heard of tides, high and low tide, but do you know what they actually are? Tides are created by the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon, which causes the rise and fall of the ocean. If you were in outer space, 
like hanging out at the International Space Station, you could probably see like the ocean bulge in response to the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon creating tides. So where the ocean is bulging, being pulled towards the sun or the moon, like you'll be at high tide and like the opposite side of the planet will be at low tide. And it tends to oscillate in anywhere from eight to 12 hour cycles, okay? The portion of the shoreline that lies between high and low tide, that's called the intertidal zone. And organisms that live there, they're really special too. They have to deal with periodic like intense sunlight and drying and then other times where they're completely underwater, right? Intertidal ecosystems have high levels of sunlight, nutrients, and oxygen in the light. The photic zone of the marine biome includes the vast expanse of the open ocean that covers most of the Earth's surface. Most of the organisms that live in the marine biome are actually plankton and do a lot of photosynthesis. It's these organisms that we credit most for the oxygen atmosphere that we all enjoy. I know you've probably all heard people say, oh, you got to protect trees because they recycle our oxygen. Well, you also ought to protect oceans because they recycle more oxygen than all the trees on land combined. Even the tropical rainforest that, you know, is touted as being super diverse and super packed with plant life, well, it recycles 20% of our breathable air. Guess where the other 80% is recycled? Yep, the ocean, okay? Plankton are important also because they form the basis of all aquatic food chains. So large animals from whales and whale sharks all the way down to small fish like sardines all rely on this plankton as a food source. So not only are they making something for you in the way of oxygen, but they're also feeding all kinds of other organisms just, you know, keeping the food chain alive. And then, yeah, we can benefit from that as well because, you know, if you like fish, okay, like that's part of the food chain. Freshwater biomes, um, pretty much freshwater biomes, again, river, lakes, and streams uh, all on land, and they eventually run or should hopefully run downhill to like maybe the ocean. Although the summer sun heats the surface of a lake, well, uh, the water a few feet below the surface can actually remain cold in a freshwater biome. Temperature variations within lakes and even, you know, large bodies of water like streams and rivers um, can affect the, the life forms that exist there. Uh, another abiotic factor that limits life in deep lakes is light. Just like light limits life in the deep ocean, it can limit life in a deep lake. Other places where land and water meet are called wetlands. Wetlands are a little bit different than estuaries because wetlands don't often have an intermingling of fresh and salt water. It's basically just a whole lot of fresh water creating swamps and marshes, okay? So to kind of like walk you through this, there are several different kinds of wetlands. Swamps have trees, marshes do not, but both usually have water flowing through them. Other wetland areas called bogs get their water supply from rain. The water does not flow through a bog. It simply sits there and stagnates. Now, when you think about what causes, you know, life on land to be different, we got to shift gears a little bit and start looking at latitude and climate. Latitude describes your position in degrees north and south of the equator. And as you can see from this picture, Depending on where you are, north and south from the equator, will depend on how much direct sunlight you get. The amount of direct sunlight you get will translate directly to things like temperature and rainfall. Um, that's huge, determining who lives where and why. Couple that with elevation, like there's mountains in some places and deep valleys in others, and you should start to be developing a picture of why certain species live in some places, but not others. At different latitudes, the sun strikes the earth differently. As a result, the climate, wind, cloud cover, temperature, humidity, and precipitation in that area are different. That's where we get all of our terrestrial biomes. Latitude and climate are abiotic factors that affect the plants and animals that will survive in an area. 
This is a graph indicating the connection between the two and what biomes we'll find on land. Next, I'm going to run you through a series of slides fairly quickly just to share with you um, the individual biomes and um, some of their basic characteristics, starting here with the tundra. The tundra is a treeless land with long summer days and short periods of winter sunlight. You can see from this graph, right, the connection between temperature and precipitation throughout the course of the year. Life on the tundra, well, because of its latitude, temperatures in the tundra never rise above freezing for long, and only the topmost layer of soil thaws out during the summer. Underneath this top layer is a layer permanently frozen ground called permafrost, and the soil largely lacks nutrients. So most of the plant life we find here in the tundra is very, very low growing. You don't have big tall trees because the roots can't penetrate the permafrost. So if you tried to grow more than a few feet high, well, the wind would knock you over, okay? The lack of nutrients limits the types of organisms the tundra can support. The short growing season limits the types of plants. Most of the life in the tundra biome includes grasses, dwarf shrubs, and cushion plants. Hordes of mosquitoes and black flies are some of the most common tundra insects during the short summer. The tundra also is home to a variety of small mammals, including rat-like lemmings, weasels, arctic fox, snowshoe hare, and even birds such as the snowy owl and hawk. Musk, oxen, caribou, and reindeer are amongst the few large animals that might migrate to the area and graze during the summer months. Next is the taiga. The taiga is just south of the tundra, and, you know, it lies, uh, it, it, it basically, you know, is the next biome down um, encircling the North Pole. The taiga is also called the boreal forest or the northern coniferous forest. The most common life form here are, are trees, basically cone-bearing trees, fir, hemlock, spruce, pine trees, okay? Because of their latitude, taiga communities usually are somewhat warmer and wetter than the tundra. Here you can see their temperature and precipitation charted for you. The prevailing climatic conditions in the taiga, although warmer than the tundra, are still harsh with long, severe winters and short, mild summers. The topsoil, which develops slowly from decaying coniferous needles, is very acidic and poor in minerals. You do have more large species of animals in the taiga than you do in the tundra. Next is the desert. The desert biome, well, it's common in the arid regions of our planet, or basically places that don't get much precipitation. Keep in mind, you can have high deserts and low deserts. It's just a matter of how much rainfall do you get. You can have hot deserts and you can have cold deserts. At the end of the day, these are regions that don't get much precipitation and subsequently they don't have much plant life. And without plant life, you also aren't going to have much animal life. Here's the connection between temperature and precipitation. Keep in mind that the green is the uh, temperature piece and the precipitation is blue in this graph. Deserts usually get less than 25 centimeters of precipitation annually. Life in the desert, well, rainfall, as I said, is the major limiting factor. Um, you know, without that rainfall, vegetation in deserts varies greatly. The driest deserts are dominated by little more than drifting sand dunes. Many desert plants, well, they're annuals. They'll germinate from seed. They'll grow to maturity quickly after a sporadic rainfall, and then the, the, the parent plant dies away, and the seeds will stay in the sand until the next rainfall. Um, the leaves of some desert plants can curl up or even drop altogether, reducing water loss during dry spells. And mammals, you know, they have a lot of similar adaptations. They can remain undercover during the heat of the day and emerge only at night to forage on plants. Things like coyote, hawk, owl, roadrunners, they're all carn carnivores that feed on snakes, lizards, and other small mammals in the desert. Next is the grassland. The grassland are large communities covered with rich soil, grasses, and similar plants. Here's the graph illustrating their precipitation and temperature data. Grasslands occur principally in climates that experience a dry season 
where insufficient water exists to support a forest. Grasslands contain very few trees per hectare, but there is the possibility of some. The soils of grasslands have a considerable amount of humus, which is like really thick, rich um, organic material that is formed as the grasses die off each winter, um, leaving byproducts to decay and build up in the soil, which makes grasslands a really good farmland. At certain times of the year, many grasslands are populated by herds of grazing animals. Other important prairie animals um, include jackrabbits, deer, elk, and prairie dogs. Many species of insects, birds, and reptiles also make their homes in the grasslands. Next is the temperate forest. The temperate forest, well, this occurs when precipitation ranges from about 70 to 150 centimeters per year, and, um, and the trees themselves that grow here are deciduous. This is a um, idea of what the temperate rain, temperate forest um, precipitation and uh, temperature is like. Um, as far as temperate or deciduous forests are concerned, the dominant life form is a deciduous tree, basically a tree that loses its leaves. As a result, the soil of the temperate forest usually consists of a top layer that's rich in humus and a deeper layer of clay. Life in the temperate forest? Well, the animals that live here um, include things like squirrels, mice, rabbits, deer, and bear. Many birds, such as blue jays, you know, live in the forest all year long, whereas other birds might migrate through seasonally. Almost done, gang. Rainforests. The rainforest, you know, there's tropical rainforests that I'm sure you've seen uh, many times in television and in books. But there's also a rainforest called temperate rainforest, and um, that one is something that maybe you haven't seen before. Temperate rainforests are found in the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State and in other places like South America, New Zealand, and Australia. They're almost completely wiped out. The closest example to a temperate rainforest that we have here in California might be some of the really wet coastal range mountains that are up in the Santa Cruz and Monterey uh, County areas. Uh, life in the rainforest, well, you're gonna get wet if you live in the rainforest. It's typically warm and it rains a lot, leading to lush plant growth. This is a connection in a graphic sense between the precipitation and temperature data um, for the rainforest. You can see down at the bottom, the blue indicates lots and lots of rain and pretty consistent warmth. Rainforests receive at least 200 centimeters of rain annually. Some rainforests can receive as much as 600. That's like several feet of water. That's a crazy amount of water. For one reason or another, um, you know, these guys just kind of have the perfect storm, no pun intended, when it comes to rain. Um, the large amount of rain leads to lots and lots of plant life. And with lots and lots of plant life, we have lots and lots of available niches for animals. Um, those niches exist in tiers up through the forest in what we call vertically, vertical layering. So the tropical rainforest canopy, the canopy layer exists from 25 to 45 meters high as kind of a living roof for the tropical rainforest. And at each tier in the canopy, we find different living things. The treetops are exposed to rain and sunlight and strong winds. Um, a few giant trees called emergence will pull through the canopy. Monkeys will frequently pass through. Birds such as scarlet macaw will live on the fruits and nuts of trees at that level. In the understory, the air is still humid and dark. Vines grow from the soil to the canopy. Leaf cutter ants harvest leaves and bring them to the ground. And, you know, the plant life changes, so the animal life changes. We have ferns and broadleaf shrubs and dwarf palms in the understory. Insects are the most common creature in the understory. The limbs of trees are hung with thick layers of epiphytes, which is like moss hanging from them. These are plants that get most of their moisture from the air. Birds and bats are common in the understory because they prey on the insects. Tree frogs are also common in the understory. Reptiles like chameleons and snakes can also be found here. Um, the next layer 
in the rainforest is the ground layer. The ground layer is the moist forest floor. Leaves and other organic materials decay there quickly. Roots spread through the top 18 inches of soil and like plant life fights for whatever nutrients it can get. Mammals living on the ground include rodents, cats such as the jaguar, ants, termites, earthworms, bacteria, and fungus. They live in the soil and quickly decompose any organic matter that might be present there. So life in the rainforest, it's pretty complex and it's very, very crowded. Some rainforest plants are important sources of medicinal products and hardwood trees have produced a source of income for the people that live there, okay? Um, agricultural land is not common in rainforests, which means that countries that have lots of rainforests have a really hard time figuring out what they're gonna do to make money for the people that live in that country. And lastly, the soils in the rainforest don't have substantial amounts of organic matter because it rains so much. If you look at the rivers in rainforests, like they're usually pretty brown because most of the organic matter that's decomposing in the top 18 inches of soil gets washed off all the time. Without organic matter, once rainforest soil is exposed and farmed, it becomes hard, brick-like, nutrient poor in a matter of few years and can't be used for anything. So the rainforest is a very delicate ecosystem. There's tons to learn from it. We don't have time to talk about all the facets of the rainforest here. So I hope you've enjoyed this quick trip through the planet's biomes and you've learned a little bit along the way. Don't forget, right? You can, you can watch this video back as many times as you need to. It's always on my YouTube channel. Um, I'm Mr. Kennedy and I will see you next time.